Welcome back to part two on cheese. I'm Evan Rowell, and this is Critical Thinking about cheese. All right, first off, if you haven't um, watched part one um, and you want to know exactly what's going on here, I would encourage you to go back and watch part one first. It'll give you a lead up to exactly what all this is and, and what this is here. Uh, it all has to do with preparing, freeze drying, and more importantly, reconstituting cheese. And I have got a lot of samples of cheese here that I have freeze dried and reconstituted. I've uh, been, they've been reconstituted or rehydrated, I should say, for about 18 hours. And I was very, very pleased with the results, okay? Now, um, what I have here is there's a different type of cheese in every one of these jars, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna uh, go around the, the table here and I'm gonna tell you what I've got here, okay? First off is ice cream. Uh, these are ice cream sandwiches. Uh, they make a great snack, but you don't rehydrate them, okay? I've got non-fat milk. I didn't do this. Um, I put this out here so that you can know that if you're going to do non-fat dry milk, it's better to buy it than it is to try to freeze dry it because it'll cost you a fortune to freeze dry it uh, for what you can get it for a uh, commercial pack. All right, I've got um, goat cheese. I've got um, cottage cheese, feta cheese, half and half milk. I got sour cream. I got whole milk. I've got cream cheese. Um, the infamous... Velveeta, and if you haven't watched the first video, you'll understand why I say that. I've even got vanilla yogurt, and on this side, I got Parmesan, I got Swiss, American, uh, provolone, mozzarella, queso, pepper jack, uh, sharp cheddar, I got Munster, Monterey Jack, Colby Monterey, and Colby Jack cheese. I have spent about a couple of months, a um, little over two months, doing all of this so I could research it and show you how to successfully freeze dry and reconstitute cheese. But before I get into that, I, I'm so passionate about this, I, I want to um, talk about it, not, not at length, but this is a jar of almonds that I have ground up. I bought them fresh, and this is a jar of coconut. And if you are a fan of almond milk and coconut milk that you buy at the store, such as the Silk brand or the Almond Breeze, you got to stop. All right, you got to stop drinking that stuff. I, it, it is pure garbage. And let me tell you why. Now, remember, I've already made a whole video um, documenting what you're finding, but I'm going to go over it real quick here again. This is um, Almond Breeze. This is one quart. And this is what you're finding in there, okay? And this is one quart of coconut drink. And, and believe me, it's not milk. It's drink. It's, uh, it's terrible stuff. And... The fact of the matter is, out of all of this, I'll show you why this is the coconut drink. There's only about that much actual coconut in the whole half gallon. And the almond drink is the same way. There's only about that much in the whole half gallon of, or I should say, a quart. Okay, so there's about twice that much. But this all came out of a quart. It didn't come out of a half gallon. This also came out of a quart. And I'll show you the comparison. This is the stuff I made myself. This is what came out of a quart of coconut milk that I made myself. You can see the difference here. There's, that's the coconut. You, you can't tell the difference. I mean, really, look at that. They're about the same amount, and they're both the same color. But um, here you've got coconut. This is white. This is brown. Okay, you taste this, it tastes like coconut. Okay, you taste this, it tastes like salt. If I didn't know better, I'd swear that 50% of that was table salt. You dip your finger in there and taste it and it's terrible. Okay, I don't, I don't know how it is that they managed to put that into uh, a half gallon of milk or a half gallon of water without you tasting the salt. But anyhow, the almond is the same way. Look at this. That's what um, almond, that's how much almond I got out of the stuff that I made, and that's how much almond came out of the almond breeze. However, this is all almond. There's no additives, there's no fillers, there's no salt, there's no phosphates, there's none of that crap. 
This, when I did the analysis, and if you're interested, go ahead and, and, um, and uh, watch that other video. I'll put a link to it down below. There's only about, eh, maybe that much almond in that whole four cups of almond milk. And in this one, there's that much almond in that four cups. So basically, what I'm trying to tell you, I was so taken back and I was so angered by what people are led to believe when it comes to, you know, store-bought and prepackaged stuff that uh, I'm, I'm a real advocate of do-it-yourself, okay? You can take this almond and in about five minutes or less, you can have real almond drink. And believe me, it's not milk. There's no milk in this. Nuts do not produce milk. Um, and coconut, even coconut does not produce milk. It's flavored water. Okay, and so I use um, real almond, I use real coconut, and I blend it to, and I liquefy it in, in a blender, and that's what I use in place of milk. And it's cheaper. Okay, you can buy a pound of fresh almonds, and that's about what's in here. Maybe, uh, I think there's a, about a, a cup maybe a cup and a half that didn't fit into this because I used it in my experimentation. And uh, that was about $9, nine, almost $10. But for the amount of almond that you actually get in your drink, you could easily make, I don't know, a minimum of four to five gallons, okay, of almond milk with a pound of almonds and the amount you get in each one, the flavor is better. And anyhow, go back and, and watch that on my comparison on almond and coconut milk, store-bought, and almond and coconut milk that you make yourself. It's healthier, you'll save money, you won't get all the salts, the salts and, and garbage that's in it. And so anyhow, uh, so now on to, this is all the, the cheese that I've done. Now, the first, I'm gonna reiterate the rules of doing cheese. And the first rule is if you don't have to reconstitute it, don't. I'll tell you what, this is one that I haven't uh, reconstituted yet. This is Colby Jack. And I'm going to show you how dry, and that is absolutely aired dry, that goes into that bowl. And if you don't have to reconstitute it, if you can put this on your salads or if you can put it in your recipes, if you, you know, just add a little bit of a couple extra tablespoons of water to your recipe uh, to make up for the water that the cheese is going to absorb. Um, when, when your recipe is cooked, that, will ex that accelerates the rehydration process of the cheese and, uh, and it's wonderful, okay? And another thing you need to consider is this, when the water is extracted out of cheese, it doesn't extract the flavor. So what it does is it actually concentrates the flavor of the cheese in the freeze-dried cheese product itself. Mm. And that, that is just delicious. That Colby Jack, and uh, this, is all, this is Colby Jack and Monterey, the flavor just bursts out at you. And uh, boy, that's good. I could take that to work and just snack on it the way it is right there, but you got to be careful with that because you can, you can overdo it with the cheese, and anybody who has ever overdone it with the cheese knows exactly what happens when you overdo it with the cheese, and sometimes it's not fun. But anyhow, so we want to go on now, and we want to talk about some of the finer points of freeze-drying and reconstituting the lighter cheese. Now, in part one, we talked about uh, the heavier cheeses, everything from the Velveeta cheese all, all the way up to the Parmesan. At this time, I want to talk a little bit and I want to show you a little bit about the lighter cheeses, the goat cheese and, and the cottage cheese and the other things that, that you need to, um, to do to be successful with that. And so I'm going to start with milk. Um, whole milk. When I do milk, because uh, most commercial packed milk is non-fat. When I do milk, I like to have full fat milk in there because if I'm going to take the time and the energy that it takes in a freeze dryer to do milk, I do a quarter at a time. And number one, if I'm going to do liquids, I never do more than two trays. 
because you will overload um, your freeze dryer with moisture. I had it happen not too long ago with spaghetti sauce. I put too much spaghetti sauce in there. It stalled my uh, freeze dryer. I had too much ice in there and it built up and I'm going to make a video showing what happens when you put too much food in or I should say too much wet food in a freeze dryer. So I usually do two trays along with something else. Uh, I'll put fruit in there or vegetables or something in the other two trays and I'll do milk. Here's another thing that you want to be concerned about. Although milk, I've never had a problem with it um, freeze drying and causing problems, there are some other things that I, I did do. When I did the video on the almond milk and the coconut milk, I had four trays of liquid and I was real lucky, but I learned from somebody else on YouTube uh, a way to actually be successful at doing water or high, high, high liquid stuff such as milk and other products with a high liquid content. And how they do that is like this. Not too long ago, I went down to Walmart no less and I found these aluminum trays and I had some extra um, silicone inserts from Harvest Right, so I, I, I cut up a couple of those so I would have a bottom to this tray. And what I do now, instead of just filling up a, a Harvest Right tray, a full tray with a quart of milk, I'll fill one of these up and I'll fill it up pretty much to the top. And I'll put two per tray or Harvest Right tray that I want to fill up. And I'll fill up two of these with whatever liquid's in there, okay? Then when the liquid is completely frozen, I'll dump the liquid out of it and I'll crush it up. All right, now that what that does is that'll increase the surface area that the, um, the freeze dry, that is exposed to the inside of the freeze dryer. And it will freeze dry more efficiently. It'll freeze dry faster. Because when I crush it up, then I'll dump two trays of this into a harvest right tray. And that's what I'll put into the harvest right freeze dryer. And, and then when I start the cycle, you'd be surprised at how much time that will cut off the dry time. So anyhow, that's how I do uh, milk. Uh, that's what I did with my half and half. That's what I did with, with, um, I, with the cottage cheese. I, because cottage cheese has um, a lot of liquid in it. And anytime now that I do anything with a lot of uh, water in it or a high water content, I'll usually freeze it first and then I'll break it up and then I'll put it in the harvest right tray and put it in the freeze dryer and I have found much more success that way. Okay, uh, the feta cheese, um, I found that you didn't have to shred the feta cheese. Okay, um, I just poured the feta cheese in the harvest right tray, I froze it and when it came out, it, um, it crumbled. Okay, so it, it wasn't like this um, Velveeta, which I talked about in my first video, which came out hard as a rock. But um, the feta cheese, you don't have to crumble. The half and half, I, I pre-froze again and crumbled it up uh, while it was frozen. Uh, the sour cream, I, um, I didn't have to shred it. And there is a way to shred, and, um, you know, really soft products. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into that in a minute. But sour cream came out and it just crumbled up. Of course, the whole milk, it just fell out into the pan and, and fell into a... Uh, a it, it's hard to, to describe what that looks like in there. It's kind of... Um, it almost looks like cellophane. But anyhow, that's whole milk. The vanilla yogurt was another one that I didn't have to shred. And uh, the Velveeta cheese was about the first one as far as being how dense they are that I had to shred. And all of these I had to shred, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you why. So now, how did I manage to shred Velveeta cheese and brie? Brie was the only cheese that failed. The reason that it failed, and I couldn't freeze dry it successfully, I even ran the same batch of Brie's, uh, Brie um, melting cheese through two complete cycles of the freeze dryer. And although it did freeze, and I was able to shred it before I froze it, um, the butterfat content was just too high. 
and it came out, it was dry, you could tell there was no more water in it, but it was still pliable. It was kind of leathery. The, the shards were, were leathery, they were bendable, I could tell that it had too much uh, fat and oils in it, and that it wasn't going to store long term. However, however, if you were to put that same brie in a jar and put it in your freezer, now the, the, the fact that there was no water in there would keep it you know, from, from freezing solid um, with the water content, but it would last for, I'm, you know, I'm no expert, but I'm sure it would last for years if you wanted to do brie. But um, that begs the question, if you're gonna freeze brie, why not just buy the brie and put it in the freezer in, in a whole brick? So uh, that's why I'm not gonna mess around with brie too much anymore. But um, I told you in the last video that I would tell you how I managed to shred Velveeta cheese and the brie for that matter. What happened was when I realized that I was going to have to shred all of this cheese to make it so that I could rehydrate it when the time came, I was going to have to, I was going to, have to shred it. But you can't shred Velveeta cheese at room temperature or even out of the refrigerator when it's cold. And so I got to thinking to myself, you know, maybe I should freeze it. And so I did that. And for those of you who are worried that freezing cheese is going to change its constitution, its texture, its flavor, and everything, you got to remember that in the freeze drying process, it's going to drop the temperature of that cheese down to between 20 and 30 degrees below zero. So it's going to, the freeze dryer is going to freeze it, and then it's going to dry it. Okay, so I don't worry about that. So what I did was I took a, um, I took a two-pound block of, of Velveeta, and I cut it lengthwise both uh, horizontally and vertically. So I had four long pieces of Velveeta cheese that would fit down into my, uh, uh, into my KitchenAid uh, shredding unit. And so after I had cut it into, you know, they, they were about two inch long sections, uh, the full length of the, of the Velveeta cheese block, I put it into my freezer and I let it sit there for about four hours and I didn't let it freeze solid, but it was frozen enough that when it came out, it actually, it kind of felt like um, the cheddar cheese. Um, I was able, in that condition, to take the Velveeta cheese and put it in my cheese grinder, or shredder, and I was able to successfully shred it up. And you can see there, I don't know how well you can see it there, but um, there are shards of Velveeta shredded cheese there. So with that, I had, I, I kind of conquered that and I had, uh, I discovered a lot about how to do cheese. I discovered a lot about uh, what it takes. Um, primarily, I discovered that in order to be successful with doing cheese, the surface area of the piece of cheese has to be relatively large compared to the thickness of the cheese, okay? A shard, if I was to, you know, blow it up to where it would be large, you know, a shard about this long, um, the thickness of the cheese would only be about like that, but it would be really wide, so it would have a nice big uh, surface area. And, uh, and then when you reduce it down to the size of the shredded cheese, that little shard doesn't have any problem quickly absorbing the water and stopping the process of turning it into mush if you've put the right amount of water into it, not too much and not too little. So with that, we're gonna get after it here. Yes, on the last video, you saw me have these bags. They were all along the tops of these quart jars. And what they were was samples, half cup samples of each of the freeze dried cheeses, okay? so. All of these cheeses look pretty much like this one here. When I uh, when, on the last video, they were all dry and uh, ready for storage. But I wanted to show you what it would take or what it would be like when these were reconstituted. Because most people don't think that you can reconstitute cheese, but I'm here to show you that reconstituting cheese, when you do it right, 
is very easy. So let's start here with this one. This is the Swiss cheese. Now, I put a little bit too much water in the Swiss cheese. I, I said it was between three tablespoons or two and three tablespoons. I should have kept it down around two tablespoons because although it is still, it hasn't absorbed all the water, the cheese itself is still uh, separate. It hasn't turned to mush. Um, you can still feel each one of the uh, each one of the shards of uh, shredded cheese, and quite frankly, it is. It's a little bit wet, but it tastes like Swiss cheese. It basically it has the same texture. Okay. So with that one, I'll call that one a success, even though I did put a little bit too much water in it. Here is the feta. Now the feta cheese was an absolute success story. This stuff was absolutely dry and I put two and a half tablespoons of water into it and this has been 18 hours ago and look at that. It, it still crumbles and it still it feels dry but it still feels soft and I'll, I'll guarantee you if I was to put this alongside uh, fresh, fresh feta and then show it to somebody, they'd have a hard time telling which one had been freeze dried and which one had not. So feta cheese was an absolute success story. What I have here is the Munster. Again, you can see that. I'll, uh, I'll take some of this out and I'll crumble it. Uh, the Munster w it turned out great. Okay. It's um, uh, a little bit on the wet side, so I'll have to adjust that. But nevertheless, it's, uh, you can't feel any water on it. It's good and soft. This would melt. This would go into recipes. And, you know, it even balls up the way it should. Mm. Yep. Another success story. And this, 18 hours ago, was dry as the Sahara Desert. Now, for the cheddar cheese. This is the sharp cheddar cheese. This one an absolute success story. This looks exactly as that shredded cheddar cheese did that was in the bag with the exception that it looks like it's been compacted. Okay, You'd have to go through there and you'd have to break it up. And uh, But the texture is there. The, uh, the moisture content is, is perfect. And the flavor is absolutely wonderful. So, because the cheddar cheese was good, all the rest of the um, Colby's and the Jack cheeses in here are going to turn out the same way because they're all basically the same cheese. Now, this one was the pub cheese. Um, the one that I told you I wasn't sure how much water to put back into it because I hadn't, uh, hadn't paid a whole lot of attention to it. It did rehydrate, but I did put too much water into it. Um, I probably should have put only about half the amount of water um, into it that I did. I'm not even, I don't even remember how much. I think I put uh, four tablespoons of water into it. But it's, it's really loose. But I'll tell you, the way that it has um, reconstituted, it's even. And uh, I'm sure that that pub cheese would have worked out just fine if I had known how much water to put into it. Okay. What do we got here? Okay, the yogurt. This one, I have to try this. The yogurt, the texture on the yogurt is about right. Okay, I probably could have put a little more water into it, but the yogurt, it's smooth. There's no lumps in it. There's no dry spots in it. Hmm. Hmm. It tastes like cheesecake. As a matter of fact, that, that's really weird. That tastes exactly like cheesecake. The same texture, the same vanilla flavor. And now I'm going to have to remember that and do some experimentation with that to see if I haven't just discovered how to do cheesecake. 
in the freeze dryer. Wow, that's really cool. All right, the cottage cheese. This is another one that I've been kind of waiting to, to see how it turns out and whether or not I put enough water into it. And it looks like it's almost, it's almost perfect. It looks like small curd. Uh, you can still see some of the curds in it and uh, Mm. The texture is correct. I could have used a little more water into it, but it does taste like cottage cheese, and there are no dry spots, there are no lumps into it. It is, um, it feels like I spooned cottage cheese right out of the container and put it in the plastic bag. All right, the queso. Wow, that, again, is a success story. Look at that. Queso cheese is a drier cheese, it's a, a Mexican melting cheese, and it is crumbling up exactly as I have seen queso cheese um, fresh out of the store shelves. So, queso, good. What do we got here? Okay, now here's my brie. I told you that brie was not one for long-term storage. And, and I meant it, this cheese, although it's dry, still has kind of a leathery texture to it, which means it has a lot of milk fat left in it. And uh, tastes good. As a matter of fact, that would be great put directly into recipes. If you want to um, keep it for short-term storage, Put it in a jar, put it in a freezer. That's really good. Uh, if you sprinkle that on salads, um, even across the top of a, you know, a good steak or a burger or something like that, it's. I'm not calling that a failure. I'm calling that a success story, but it is definitely not for long-term storage. All right. Here's the American. Now here's something I want to make sure that I emphasize to you, you can't take American cheese that's, you know, the pre-slices, the really thin slices, and just lay them out on uh, the freeze dryer table or pan and freeze dry them and expect it to work out because it won't. I don't know what it is. I think, uh, again, it has something to do with the cross section versus the surface area. And um, it turns out it still comes out really hard. And I, I haven't got a good explanation for that. But when you try to rehydrate it, you put it in water and you let it sit and it, it just doesn't work out. I don't know why, I'm gonna do some more experimentation with it and if I find out a way that we can freeze dry um, slices of American cheese and, and successfully reconstitute them, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. But this American cheese, I bought in a block, and it's almost perfect, okay? Almost perfect. I'm making a mess out of myself here, but I don't care. I love cheese. And that tastes like a slice of American cheese. Absolute success story. What do I got here? The goat cheese. The goat cheese I put too much water into. Um, I called for um, 10 tablespoons per cup. I probably should have put about eight, so I'm gonna modify my, uh, uh, my recipe on that. That goat cheese, uh, for some reason, it lost a lot of water, but reconstituting it has caused it to be a little bit uh, looser than it should have been. But again, there's no hard spots in it. There's no dry spots in it, anything like that. All right, the mozzarella. Oh yeah, everybody knows mozzarella. It's supposed to crumble up when you put it on top of a pizza. Let's see if it crumbles. All right, look at that. Perfect. Okay, it even compresses perfectly. And now let's see what it tastes like. Mmm, mozzarella. 
success story. Absolutely success story. You can't tell the difference. Really, you can't. The Parmesan cheese, I didn't put any water in. And it is absolutely perfectly dry. And the flavor, mm, it's crunchy. And because there's no water in it, the flavor is so intense. Anything that you'd like to put Parmesan cheese on, especially spaghetti, if you don't mind the fact that it's a little bit crunchy, um, it's great. So now, last but not least, the one that I thought was going to defeat me, and that is the Velveeta cheese. And quite frankly, I guess I could have put just a hair less um, water into it. But really, it has come out just as soft. Yeah, I could have put maybe a, 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 a tablespoon less water into it, but it is just as soft as you would expect Velveeta to, uh, cheese to be when you've started to melt it. Perfect. The flavor's there. It reconstituted. It didn't turn out looking like a, uh, you could repair a brick wall with it. So there you have it. I got it. Cheese works if you know how to do it. Just remember the rules. In most cases, if it's a more dense cheese than, than Velveeta, you want to shred it. If it's a soft cheese that won't shred, partially freeze it first, then shred it and it'll work. A lot of cheeses, that the lighter stuff like the goat cheese and, the, and the, uh, the milks and the yogurts and stuff like that, you don't have to shred them because when they freeze dry, they'll crumble in your hands. Now I'm not saying that you're going to remember all of this or that you're going to have the same kind of success with uh, all of your cheeses, but if you work with it a little bit, freeze dry a little at a time, see how it works see how it rehydrates. Just don't be like most people are when they rehydrate freeze-dried material. Don't take it out of the bag and toss it into a tub of water and stare at it. No, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that with a, a, a ham and potato casserole any more than you would if you were to take it fresh out of the pan and toss it in a bowl full of water. What would you expect to happen? It's going to solidify. It's going to begin to act weird. It's, it's, it's going to fall apart. Uh, you're going to look at it for about 10 minutes and then you're going to throw it away. Uh, when you're rehydrating stuff, learn to do it right. Okay. Cheese is wonderful. Now all this is going to go into my food storage. And then I'll put it in um, the boxes I already have here. Uh, it's going to take me a while to consume all of this cheese, but consume it I will. I'm not about to waste it. And um, it's been a successful experiment from now on. I, when people talk about freeze-drying cheese, I'm going to go, you know, if you think critically about it and you learn and you do what's necessary, cheese is a wonderful thing to freeze-dry. Not only does it taste good when it's freeze-dried, but it will constitute or reconstitute or rehydrate, if you will, uh, properly if you know what you're doing. So remember, shred the cheese if you need to. Know how much water came out of the cheese by weighing it before you put it in the freeze-dryer and after you take it out of the freeze-dryer. Be patient, okay? And if the cheese is really soft, but still, like the Velveeta, needs to be shredded, freeze it. Freeze it about three quarters frozen so it's still a little bit pliable. You need to do that. And if you'll do that, you'll have all kinds of success. It'll be fun. Um, you will impress people when they see uh, this and you say, well, yeah, that's all cheese and, it, uh, and it, it rehydrates really well. And there, you know, anybody that's ever tried to freeze dry cheese before, most of the time it's going to go, uh, I never had success with it because when it was sitting in that one gallon bowl of water, it just kind of turned to mush or it wouldn't rehydrate or it wasn't very good. So with that, I'm going to end here. I hope you learned something, okay? Oh, also, ice cream doesn't rehydrate 
when you freeze dry ice cream, you have yourself a hard snack. And um, my grandkids love these things. Uh, when they come over, they'll, they'll take one of these, one or two, but be careful, again, with freeze-dried foods. It's easy to eat too much of them. You gotta make sure that you, uh, you drink plenty of water when you're eating uh, freeze-dried food. So with that, I would ask you to subscribe um, to my channel. Share this video. I'm sure that there's a lot of people, if you know anybody that's, that's into food storage or freeze drying, uh, this might be good for them to know. And uh, you can like the video and also, as usual, there's a link down below for you to visit my gallery. I'm not going to harp on it. I'm, I'm sure that everybody's already known about that, but there's the address. Uh, it's evanrophotography.com. I just, I just want your opinion. I just want you to browse around, especially my fireworks and my water drop photography. I'm especially proud of that. So with that, I'll leave you here. I'm going to go work on my next video. And um, until then, I'm Evan Rowell, and this is Critical Thinking About Cheese.